All right, and we have here another unusual variation of the Mauser 1871-84. Um, I bought this gun years ago. I guess the guy I bought the one one of the Mausers from had it too. He sold me uh, the guns he had in his collection. And as you can see, this gun is modified. Now, some people will say that it's one of the... Uh, Guns used by the Quebec Pontifical Unit or the militia that was up there in Quebec that was based on a religious organization that I guess originally, because Ian McCulloch just did a story on these rifles and how this all came about. During the unification of Italy, uh, Quebec is the French area of Canada, and they're all Roman Catholics. They're very devout, and in the old days, you didn't have a National Guard. Cities had militias and militia units, and I guess they did that up in Canada. Well, this unit volunteered to go defend uh, the Vatican when Italy was reunifying into one country instead of a bunch of states. You know, like Germany had a bunch of states that were unified into a country, same with Italy, and they were going to reunify Italy into one country again. So these people volunteered, and to this militia unit, because, uh, I guess Ian said they're short on money, they called up Bannerman and bought a bunch of Mauser, 1871-84 rifles. You know, they were not in service anymore, so they were sold as surplus. So this unit went off and left, and uh, he tells a history about it, but they came back with their guns, and they had their guns, and it was a militia unit. Now, uh, I guess that this unit still stayed together, even though it wasn't quite a militia unit, it was more of a religious uh, type of society. And what do I mean by that? This photograph is uh, of a group of people in the St. Michael's Society, which my church, that was a organization that was there for ceremonial purposes, Easter, Christmas, whatever. And this was tied in to the Catholic Church. At the time I was a child when these pictures were taken, it wasn't a militia unit. Uh, and as you see, you got decked out in a uniform. And in this photograph from the left to the right is my cousin Richard, my grandfather, who would be his uncle, and then the other gentleman in the uh, there next to him is my great uncle Matt, and I'm not quite sure who the man all the way to the right is. I do remember his face as a child. He must have been a friend of Richard's, because uh, I remember seeing him around when everybody gathered during the holidays. This unit was not a militia unit. There were no firearms. It was sabers. And they would go out in the regalia, and this is outside the church. And they would be there for ceremonies and things like that. Uh, you know, there's St. Michael's Society. There was the Knights of St. John's at the other church, the Knights of Columbus. I think everybody's familiar with them. That's more of a recognized organization. All right, so getting back to the guys up in Canada. They had these rifles. They kept them. And I guess during World War II... Um, they actually issued these. Now, the, there's a little bit of confusion. I don't know if these were cut down by Bannerman or by the organization up there, but when Ian did the video and showed the uh, an actual ceremonial rifle that was used, it was up for auction, and it had a unit marking and a rack number. It, you know, it had the militia's stamp here in the stock. The gun was cut down. The magazine plug was removed, or the magazine was removed and this was plugged. And this barrel band was set back further. 
and you could see where it was roughly cut and they just bolted like a little block here. This one here has the rear sight uh, re-soldered back on. And there was just a little block where this weird bayonet type thing, this uh, socket bayonet would rotate on there and it was this bayonet. And it had a uh, bayonet and a scabbard net, like you see these uniforms, probably they had the web gear to go with it. And they were just used for ceremonial purposes. Okay, if you watch Ian's video, let me get a better look at this. Okay, this rifle has been cut down, but it has a proper crowning and finishing of the barrel. And the sight... Uh, has been re-soldered back onto the barrel in the correct place that you can shoot this and hit something. And the magazine uh, tube has been cut down. Uh, this one, the spring wasn't in there. But the uh, follower and the cap is in there. And when I fire this, this thing comes loose. Also with this modification, this barrel band kind of retains that end cap. Well, that's not the way it was. There was actually a wedge and a screw in the uh, front barrel band on the actual rifle that held this in place. Um, but my buddies from up there in the Great White North, I know uh, one of them has one of these and they're quite familiar with this rifle modified the way it is uh, up there in Canada. And Ian was confusing. I don't know if these guns were modified later on as an emergency thing in World War II and actually used for a home guard. Um, that's why Dominion made ammunition in this caliber way into the 50s. Okay. And I think Ian was surmising that uh, going back and forth with the guns, they may have been modified by Bannerman or by the Canadians, I'm not quite sure. But it was, I guess long story short, it was the only time that a Mauser rifle was officially recognized and inventoried by the Canadian government. So let's take a look at the markings here. These are all the German markings. Okay, there's nothing else on this gun that uh, would show that it's been used. And again, this is another Spandau. Now I'm noticing a lot of these surplus guns show up 1888 Spandau and they do not have German unit markings on the butt plate. Which that will be down here. They marked them here. And I noticed on the two examples I have there's no markings meaning that they were probably not issued they were probably the last of a production run and probably were stored and sold as surplus. Henceforth, no unit markings. And at common date, 1888, which we all know that's when they kind of adopted the uh, commission rifle in 8mm Mauser, the first smokeless gun. And as I said, if we take a look at markings, and I'll get the stock over here where we can look. You know, this stock gotten a little bit beat up over the years, but you see the official German markings, which those go there. There, there doesn't appear to be anything from uh, the Canadian markings. And this stock was kind of sanded a little and worked on to a degree. You know, there's some more down here by the wrist. It's a crown in that, so I'm, I'm going to say it's imperial markings. Okay. And really, there's nothing on the other side. There's, there's no rack number or anything like that, like on the example that Ian had uh, at the auction house. Of course, but then again, that gun was a ceremonial gun. Where these rifles are a functioning rifle. I believe it's probably, I'm just guessing, because I, like I said, the magazine's not functioning at this point. It's another project I've postponed for God knows how many years. But I'm going to get it back, so probably a five-shot bag, down from eight to five. And like I said, that has been 
that that's the original site and that has been after they cut the barrel uh resoldered back on there so this is another interesting variation and like i said i have seen actual identical examples so there were enough of them around to where you do run across them on the internet now talking about modifications we've gone on long enough with this uh Canadian one, um, an individual sent me an email and saying, hey, I have this 7184 Mauser. It's in really nice condition, the bluing's good in that, but it's shortened, it's been shortened uh, so, uh, a different length. Hold on a second. So here we have the two guns side by side, and as you can see, got that just about lined up. There's been a bit of the barrel cut off, okay, shortened. So he asked me, and I described the gun, showed him a picture of this one. He goes, no, it's not like that. It's just he thought it was a carbine. It was a standard uh, 7184, but everything was there, the cap and everything, but it was just shortened a bit. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what he's talking about. And he's going, I can't find it in any reference book. The Germans didn't make that, which the Germans didn't. You will not find this gun in a reference book because this is a post-war modification that was not done by the German army. And the gun he had, because he was telling me it's not a cut-down rifle, it's been done in an arsenal. Then I remembered that, I think it's Siam, one of these Asian countries bought a bunch of of these guns and because they're so huge and heavy and the native people the stature of them the gun was longer than, or taller than the people they actually cut them down and had them professionally redone in a government arsenal so it is not a bannerman it is not uh, you know somebody uh, surplus company shortened them to sell them as hunting rifles there are modifications of this rifle that was done by a legitimate government and they just shortened them up and you'll find these weird variations of a lot of these older guns either it was done by another country so the variation and photographs of it if the author's writing a book on the history of this rifle it will not be in there because it was not used by the Germans in that way it was repurposed and nicely you know modified not like this this is kind of crude looking but it was just a prune the barrels back a bit okay and uh, that was done in the government arsenal it's a professional job and it looks well okay so you will find these strange variations of a lot of these older guns um, and Bannerman was famous for doing all kinds of strange things with the leftover parts I had a older trap door, 5070 trap door, the receiver was correct, but I believe the barrel came off of a Remington rolling block because where the sights were and the type of sights on there, that, that wasn't how they made Springfield trap doors. It was another barrel attached to a trap door uh, receiver and then he modified the barrel for it to fit in the stock on a trap door so you'll find strange stuff like that floating around every now and again all right guys this one got kind of long but it's interesting and uh you know comment sections open i know my buddies will tell me all about it and carry on so go right ahead and you know maybe we'll do a follow-up once i get some more information dragging this thing out and talking about it again do a follow-up video. Alright, hit the like button, subscribe, and stay tuned.